Now on BBC Radio 4, The Real McColl. As we approach the centenary of his birth, John Cooper Clark looks back at the early life of Ewan McColl, a working-class boy from Salford who became renowned as a dramatist, broadcaster, songwriter and folk singer. Salford is the birthplace of many interesting figures from the arts world. Artist Harold Riley, actors Albert Finney and Christopher Eccleston, playwright Sheila Delaney, musician Mark E. Smith and master of the Queen's music Sir Peter Maxwell Davis, to name just a few. I also was born there on the same date, though not the same year, as the man who immortalised our city in song. The song being Dirty Old Town, the man being Ewan McCall. I found my love on the gasworks craft Dreamed a dream by the old canal Kissed my girl by the factory wall Dirty old town, dirty old town. It's as a singer and songwriter of songs like that and the first time ever I saw your face for which he is probably best known. But it's perhaps the least known things about him that are the most fascinating. His struggles as a young boy growing up in the Salford slums, his involvement with radical street theatre and his change of identity after the Second World War. Let's begin by winding the clock back three months to 22nd of October 2014, the 25th anniversary of Ewan McCall's death. It's a cold, bright autumn day and a group of Ewan's friends and acquaintances are gathered in the northeast corner of London's Russell Square, as they do every year at midday on the anniversaries of his birth and his death. They talk, laugh, drink beer and whiskey and share memories of their Ewan. They are standing a stone's throw from an oak tree that was planted in his memory. Now you see it, now you can see how big it's growing. The roses get put on it every year. There's a few daffodils come up which we stuck bulbs in. And today, Nicola, who was uh, Camden Trades Council secretary, she stuck in some rosemary somewhere in there. So this is just our memory of Ewan. First of all, it's an oak tree. It, not inappropriately, and it's about 30 foot high by now. And if you go over there, you can read what it says on the plaque. This oak tree was planted in recognition of the strength and singleness of purpose for the fighter for peace and socialism. Ewan McCall, 25th of the 1st, 1915, died on the 22nd of the 10th, 1989. Folk laureate, singer, dramatist and Marxist. You can't ask a great deal more out of a human being than that. Heard a siren from the docks Saw a train set the night on fire Smelt the spring on the smoky wind Dirty old town, dirty old town. This is how Ewan McCall described the Salford of his childhood. Salford was a desert, a petrified desert of blackened and decayed brick. Its bleakness was such as to cripple the imagination of any but the toughest kid, and black, black as the Earl of Hell's waistcoat. Salford has changed a lot. After recent regeneration projects in and around the docks that were abandoned in the early 80s, Salford is now home to the Lowry Theatre and Galleries, the BBC's new quayside development media city and a university. Tall, shiny buildings now grace the Salford skyline. Back in McCall's day, the skyline was very different, dominated by the dozens of chimneys from the numerous factories and mills belching out black and grey smoke. Local historian and president of the Salford Local History Society, Roy Bullock, is at Salford's Peel Park. We're now at the top of the park, looking down. He sung about the dirty old town, and this would have been an ideal spot to see the dirty old town in all its glory. Salford wasn't a one-horse town. It, it was built up of many, many different industries, some very small, some large, you know, so uh, steel, 
shipping on the docks, cotton mills. So it was a hive of many industries. Sadly, lots of them were dirty industries. That's where the, the dirt came from and the, and the old town got christened. As I always say, we're at the thick end of the river, so we've got everybody's muck. <laughs> dirty old town, dirty old town. the sole surviving child of four. Ewan McCall was born James Henry Miller on 25th of January 1915 in the Lower Broughton area of Salford. As a result of the booming textile industry, the town had enjoyed massive growth during the Industrial Revolution and what was once a small market town was transformed into a major industrial centre. In the early 20th century, the heavy industries on which the communities depended started to decline, and during the 1920s and 30s, its population had plummeted by 29%. American folk singer and musician Peggy Seeger met McCall in 1956. It was for her he wrote, The First Time Ever I Saw Your Face. Peggy was his partner until the day he died. He had a sense of continual personal humiliation. His childhood was one of personal humiliation. Brought up very, very poor. They lived in a Salford slum on Coburg Street. His father, for the most of Ewan's memory, was blacklisted. He was an iron molder, blacklisted for political activity. His mother got up 4.30 in the morning, took the bus to where she would clean offices, then she would go and clean people's houses. Occasionally, when he was not at school, he would go with her and just sit while she scrubbed Mrs. Mark's kitchen floor, Marks and Spencer's. He remembers her working literally like a dog because she was the main breadwinner. Then she'd come home, bringing home food that was not eaten off the table of Mrs. Marks. That kind of thing just hammers it into you that you are the lowest of the low. From an early age, James Miller, or Jimmy Miller, as he would be known up until after the Second World War, was used to political discussion and debate in the family home. His dad's involvement with the unions meant that political activities were part of everyday life. From a young age, he accompanied his father to lectures, talks and political meetings. As equally important an influence was the fact that his parents were Scots and they lived in a close-knit community of Scots friends and extended family. Ben Harker is the author of Class Act, The Cultural and Political Life of Ewan McCall. That sense of community, particularly a community that was sort of in exile, created a, a very close-knit, sometimes insular atmosphere, but that in itself became a really important vector in terms of Scottish music and Scottish singing and the Scottish cultural rituals. He knew a lot of songs by the time he, he was ten, you know, he'd heard his, sing, his parents singing these songs and that creates in him this odd sort of doubleness of living in England but also feeling Scottish and that's coming very powerfully, I think, out of that situation in which he grew up. So at home, McCall was steeped in left-wing politics as well as the ballad, songs and culture of the Celtic music tradition. He was also encouraged to read by his dad, who was an enthusiastic reader, bringing second-hand books home each Saturday from Pendleton Market. Knowledge is never a waste, son, he was frequently advised. What was he like outside of the home, at school? He was a timid boy, he was bookish, and he just immediately found school an intimidating place. It made him very anxious. And then there were sort of what might sound sort of relatively trivial episodes, but they really um, had a sort of powerful impact on the way that he, that, that he saw school. He talks about in his autobiography about the teacher would ask them to bring in an apple to draw, and there were no apples uh, in the family home, so he took in an onion. And, uh, and the teacher just um, you know, sort of taunted him with this um, for the rest of the school year. And you know, he does talk about the school being a place of um, sort of pathological cruelty you know, from some of the teachers. So he just he wants to be as inconspicuous as possible there and to leave as soon as possible. He left school in 1929, age 14, without any qualifications, just as the great slump was starting to take hold. In his memoirs, unemployment looms large and his memories of this period are vivid. 
He writes about long days spent walking through the desolation called Peel Park, of infinite and infinitely boring afternoons stretching out before him like a road that doesn't go anywhere, and of queuing at Albion Street Labour Exchange to get his unemployment card stamped. I think there's just a pervasive sense of hopelessness. There's, there's no vision of how it's going to end. One just felt locked into the community, which was disintegrating, and locked into one's neighbourhood. It was very difficult to leave home because, of course, didn't, one didn't have a job, he doesn't have any skills particularly. But the, the flip side of that, paradoxically, is that un unemployment created a lot of time to fill, and he did fill it by going to the library and reading. I mean, it sounds rather romantic looking back, but I mean, he is one of the kind of late British working class autodidacts. He really did, you know, educate himself in Salford Public Library. Salford Royal Museum and Public Library was built in Peel Park in 1849. It was the first free municipal public library in the United Kingdom and a great source of learning and entertainment for the local people. And, as he said in a 1968 interview, it was a place where one could keep warm. You go in the public library, it's warm, and the old men are standing there leaning against the pipes to get warm, and all the newspaper parts are occupied. And you pick a book up, and I can remember then, mixed in with the smell of leather that you get, the smell of the unemployed, a kind of sour or a bitter sweet smell, you know, mixed in with the smell of old books and dust and leather and all the rest of it. So that there are certain writers that if I pick up, a, say, a Dostoevsky today, particularly if it's the very earliest one I read, The House of the Dead, immediately, and with the first page, comes the, that smell, the smell of poverty in 1931, you know. There was a string of lodgers at the family home, and one of those lodgers, Harrison, was a member of the Young Communist League and was also involved in socialist theatre. He encourages McCall, still known as Jimmy Miller, of course, to get involved, so he did. First he joined socialist theatre group the Clarion Players, then he started attending the regular Young Communist League, or YCL, branch meetings. I think there, for the first time, the young McCall meets kindred spirits. He meets like-minded, working-class intellectuals who were reading in the way that he is. And, and I think the YCL and the Communist Party um, you know, took education of its militants very seriously. Members are expected to read the party literature and have a line on it. They're expected to educate themselves in the classics of Marxist-Leninism. And so suddenly, I think, that untapped intellectual energy is finding a, an outlet in a very powerful way. And you know, he, he rises quickly through the ranks of, 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 of the Communist Party partly locally and he's, he's identified by the police as being somebody to watch and very soon he's giving kind of evening classes and talks about the history of the making of the of the British working class. Well you want our wages and our benefits too but we're not gonna give it back to make less for us and more for you and we're not gonna give it back. 60% of the Communist Party nationally was unemployed at this time and its members had set up the National Unemployed Workers Movement, whose purpose was to stand up for the rights of and provide support to the growing numbers of unemployed workers in the interwar years. The early 1930s saw a series of national protests against austerity with the cuts falling heaviest on those that could least afford them. The march on Bexley Square in the autumn of 1931 was one of those protests, a flashpoint in Salford's history. 10,000 people marched on the town hall demanding no cuts to, amongst other things, unemployment benefit, free winter coal for the unemployed and free milk at school. So what specifically would have been McCall's role in protests like this one? Ben Harker again. At that point, he's involved in Agitprop Street Theatre, and his main contribution to those marches like Bexley Square would be to put on political skits from the back of a lorry, often, while people are congregated and waiting for the march to begin. The early 1930s coincides with a period of militancy across the textile industry. Big strikes, there are big demonstrations, there are lockouts, and McCall's troop, which are called the Red Megaphones by this stage, are doing those kinds of theatrical sketches. Um, so it gives him a kind of way into those um, you know, episodes in, 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 in Labour history. Spurred on by their experiences with Red Megaphones, McCall and his colleagues then formed Theatre of Action. 
Its performances in working class areas reflected workers' lives and struggles. McCall said he wanted to create a new theatre language, one which people understood that would move them but not talk down to them. In 1934, he met Joan Littlewood, a theatre student from the East End of London. She soon joined Theatre of Action, and together they became a hugely influential force in the world of theatre. McCall and Joan Littlewood married, and in 1936 formed their most ambitious theatre venture to date, Theatre Union. All the while, MI5 and the Special Branch kept an eye on the couple because of their support for the Communist Party. And in 1939, shortly after the outbreak of the Second World War, their performance of the last edition, an experimental living newspaper, a political skit which saw the world through the eyes of a socialist, was stopped by the police. They were both arrested, charged with breaching the peace and banned from theatre for two years. The necessities of wartime brought an end to Theatre Union and in July 1940, McCall, still known as Jimmy Miller of course, was called up and enlisted in the army. In December 1940, he absconded, disappeared and turned up after the war in 1945 sporting a new name, Ewan McCall. He doesn't mention the World War II years in his autobiography at all. From the 30s onwards, he becomes very interested in a kind of Scottish literary nationalism that's starting to flower, in which Scottish poets are rediscovering the forgotten Scottish writers and claiming a kind of lineage to them. And in some cases, those writers start to take the names of forgotten Scottish forebears. McCulls comes in, becomes interested in this as a young writer. He starts to exaggerate his Scottishness, and before too long he's claiming that he was born in Octorada in Perthshire, which is his mother's birthplace. And then in 1945, when he assumes the name of Ewan McCall, I mean, that is also clearly at one level a powerful identification with this Scottish literary renaissance. A whole group of Scottish poets, writers, artists decided to revive the Lallans. Tongue. So they each took a pen name. Christopher Grieve took the name Hugh McDermott, and James Henry Miller, Jimmy Miller, took the name Ewan McCall. Ewan is excoriated for doing this. He's trying to become Scots. He's trying to forget his background. He wasn't. His mother always called him Jimmy. I called him Ewan. He spoke pure Scots till he went to school. And I thought he could speak Scots beautifully. He went into Scots automatically when he was in Scotland. He just started talking like a Scot. So that was a deeply ingrained language for him. In Perth there lived a bonny lad, a brewer to his trade And he has courted Peggy Roy, a young and handsome maid. Oh, we have all a little of a day, do do we have all a little of a day, do the newly named Ewan McCall and Joan Littlewood were reunited after World War II and resumed their work in theatre, starting their final collaboration, the influential Theatre Workshop. For six years they took the theatre to the people of Britain, playing in mission halls, miners' welfares and public parks, as well as theatres. McCall wrote 11 plays during this period, a number of which were performed overseas and translated into German, French, Polish and Russian. His works were critically acclaimed and were grabbing the attention of his contemporaries. You have to remember the, the, you know, the, the quote from George Bernard Shaw. Do you know that quote? Legendary folk musician and singer Martin Carthy. Apart from myself, there is one other person of genius working in the British theatre today, and that person is Ewan McCall. That's what George Murder Shaw said. <laughs> Not only apart from myself. <laughs> I mean, he infuriated Joan Littlewood by ditching theatre and becoming a, uh, a folk singer, putting it crudely. There was a programme about him, and she actually laughed as she said it, and he, he became a folk singer, and he grew a beard. <laughs> but she obviously thought that he was a tremendous loss to theatre. <laughs> George Bernard Shaw would agree. Like many teenagers in the 1950s, Martin Carthy came to music via the skiffle craze, spurred on by Lonnie Donegan's Rock Island line, 
He picked up his dad's acoustic guitar and went on to become one of the most, if not the most, influential folk performer of the past half century. When I was at school, I was, I was big mates with the, with the bloke in the year above, a guy called Nick Nichols. And Nick started talking about this place where they, as he described it, they sang all the original versions of the skiffle hits. And it was a place called the Princess Louise in High Holborn. So I thought, going to go along there. And I went along there, and in the chair was Ewan McCall. Well, I turned up in 1956. The club had been going for four years. It was called Ballads and Blues. Martin Carthy talks about turning up. And this is one of the main features of the folk movement, is it's like a relay race, and you willingly pass the baton to the next generation. That's what the club did. It welcomed singers of all sorts, and you sat and you learned until you were good enough to sing on stage. I didn't hear anybody do any of the original versions of these skiffle hits, but I heard other stuff that, that I found really intriguing. And the spectacular one, the one that changed my life, was seeing Sam Lana. That was the first time I saw Ewan actually uh, having something to do with the music I was interested in. And he never sang a song himself all night. All he did was talk about Sam Lana and talk to Sam Lana and sort of get stories out of him and then get songs. And it was choreographed quite brilliantly. And I was completely enthralled and that governed the way I was going to go. Sam Lana was a herring fisherman from Winterton on the Norfolk coast. Ewan and Peggy, along with BBC producer Charles Parker, had visited him earlier that year, 1959, to record material for the radio ballads. The following year, the radio ballad Singing the Fishing was released. It contained a lot of the material collected from Sam Lana and won the prestigious Pre d'Italia for radio documentary. We present Sam Lana of Winterton. Up jumped the air in the king of the sea, says D to the skipper, look under your lee, singing windy old weather boys, stormy old weather boys, when the wind blow, we'll all go together. <laughs> and Ronnie Balls of Yarmouth, in Singing the Fishing, a tribute to the fishing communities of East Anglia and of the Murray Firth, whose livelihood has been the herring. If you fish for the herring, they rule your life. They swim at night. You've got to be out there at night waiting for them to swim. With our nets and gear, we're faring. Because it's a wonder, too, you see pick one of these little fish up, the mess, vibrant with life. Brrr, like that. The radio ballads were groundbreaking. It was a new format, a self-narrating documentary which told a story through the words of ordinary people, often from rarely heard communities. People's attitudes to the voices of ordinary people on the radio did change as a result. They still sound pioneering even now, and they still outstrip most BBC radio output. I mean, they, they took a long time to make, they were massively expensive, but nonetheless, I think, in terms of radicalising, formally and politically, what radio could be and do, I mean, I think it's a very powerful legacy. During the years of the Folk Revival and the Ballads and Blues Club, Ewan wasn't without his critics. Many British singers and musicians at that time were singing American songs, but Ewan led a quest to seek out music from one's own culture and did insist people should sing songs only from where they came from, and it did rub some people up the wrong way. The basic gist of it was, well, Englishmen sing English songs, Scots people sing Scots songs, Irish people sing Irish songs. I don't want to hear an, uh, an Englishman singing an American song, da 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 and people used to say, that's, a, that's outrageous. People should, should be free to do what they want to do. And to my mind, even then, it's his club. If you don't want to follow the rules, go somewhere else. Fine. But his, his reasoning was that, go and look, go and find some of this stuff, because it's, it's fascinating and beautiful and exciting. And, yeah, he's right. We wouldn't be where we are now without him. That's a fact. I wouldn't be where I am without him. 
Ewan McCall may well have been the most influential figure in the folk song revival, and as we've heard, he was a great singer, a skilled songsmith, a trailblazing broadcaster and revered playwright. A master craftsman, he wrote over 300 songs which have been sung by artists as diverse as The Pogues, Roberta Flack, Dick Gocken and Elvis. He was also a husband and a father of five, Neil, Callum and Kitty, his three children with Peggy and two from an earlier marriage to Jean Newlove, Hamish and the late Kirsty McCall. From his adolescent years growing up in Lower Broughton, Salford, the very dirty old town itself, he was a relentless campaigner for socialism and did a lot for working people's movements, both in the UK and overseas. Your childhood tells you a lot about yourself, tells other people a lot about you. People refer to me as a political personage, but I got it secondhand. I never came near to starving. It was gut politics with him, and he never, never betrayed it. I th think he would have not fitted in to where things are now. Once big industry was gone, he found it difficult to find a political niche for himself. The issues are no longer black and white. Issues are 150 shades of gray. And steering your way around that and political correctness, these are all things he would not have been comfortable with. It was so clear cut in his day. Working class and the oppressors. The worker, the boss. My old man was a union man, fought out all his days. He understood the system and was wise to the boss's ways. He said, if you want what yours by right, you'll have to struggle with all your might. They'll rob you blind if you don't fight, son, that was my old man. Let's end the programme where we began, back in Russell Square, London, 22nd of October 2014, where Ewan's friends are gathered as they do each year on the anniversaries of his birth and of his death beside the oak tree that was planted in his memory. May I thank you all <clears throat> once again for coming to celebrate a man who, for me, was just supreme. May I ask you to come on the 25th of January, which will be Ewan's 100th anniversary, and I will try to get a chair organised by then to commemorate him. Thank God. Watch out for the man with the silicon chip Hold on to your job with a good firm grip Cos if you don't, you'll have had your chips The same as my old man The Real McCall was presented by John Cooper Clark. The producer was Kelly Weil and it was a Smooth Operations production for BBC Radio 4.